I'd say there's potential. Somebody once told me the world is gonna roll me. I ain't the sharpest tool in the shed. She was looking kind of dumb with her finger and her thumb in the shape of an L on her forehead. Well, the years start coming and they don't stop coming. Fed to the rules and I hit the ground running. Didn't make sense not to live for fun. Three, two, one. In Chatelet, buckos, and welcome to Polecat Cast number 127, Zoe Quinn's book and more, where our trusty and stealthy Polecats will be ferreting out the best feels, funnies, and what the fucks to discuss Slam Bam Badger style. Mind your spines for the cringe, hold on to your sides for the lulls, and keep your chemo at the ready for this cancer. Today's Polecat panel consists of Max Derrett, Simpsons Kin, and definitely not Bumblebee, and when I say that, I mean Generation 1 Bumblebee, not that monstrosity from the Michael Bay version that has that terrifying yokai mask for a face. Goddamn right. Polecat punster and pussycat punisher Hannah, Dr. Random Cam, Britain, Panda, Puppet Master, and rabid long-range rhetorician, and me, the supreme, supreme Doge in charge, with my trusty Doge whistle so I can transmit my suspected white supremacist messages to the secret patriarchal network. Today, we will be discussing the following topics. As we know, there is no group more oppressed, more put upon, and no group more misunderstood than those looking for safe haven from their lost nation of Kekistan. Bungie was on the verge of giving the people of Kekistan a proper pre representation in their newly released AAA game, Destiny 2. Unfortunately, they have pulled the imagery because they now believe it is a symbol of hate. What would Pepe do? Evergreen State College has settled a tort claim against it from embattled Professor Brett Weinstein, or Weinstein, and his wife, Professor Heyer, Heather Haying, for $500,000, according to an email sent to faculty Friday evening. After alleging the public university permitted, cultivated, and perpetuated a racially hostile and retaliatory work environment. But is this not the monster that Weinstein helped create? Next story. If you tell anyone I've cheated, I will ruin you. Cambridge Don is cleared after his PhD student fiancé accused him of assault to get back at him for calling off their wedding after she had affairs in Galapagos Islands. Is she guilty of these things or is this just toxic or is he, I'm sorry, is he actually doing guilty of these things or is this toxic femininity at work? A new Powerpuff Girl has been introduced. And because her skin color happens to be a little darker than the original trio, and her hair is blue, it would seem that this is a step forward in progress. Is it, though? Or could it just be an attempt to make people give a shit about this reboot that nobody seems to be watching? The first reviews to Zoe Quinn's book, Crash Override Network, Gamergate, and the Battle Against Online Hate, are beginning to surface from the black ooze that is white knight yellow journalism. If you think the review gives Gamergate a fair shake, or is critical of Zoe's uh, own words, I have a real-life unicorn to sell you, along with a sack of magic beans. Or maybe just a bean. And finally, our bonus story for the patron-only after show. Portland, Oregon is one of those places that is overlooked as a hipster progressive hub, especially because it's on the left coast alongside San Francisco, Berkeley, and LA, which are basically progressive meccas, and overshadow it significantly. But it still has some ideas that border on lunacy as it makes, as it too makes the long march towards utopia. And in so doing, the Portland Comic Con, known as Rose City, has taken a strong stance against offensive cosplay. That's right, you can now no longer cosplay as Hydra members or the Red Skull because Nazis. Anyway, if you would like to participate in our after shows either as an audience member or as a participant, please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash Honey Badger Radio. Now, before I give this off to hand this off to Max to give us the first story about Kekistan, I'd like to do some shilling. YouTuber Miss Anonymous, who does uh, frequently do streams with Bane666AU and also has her own YouTube channel where she discusses men's rights, is looking for video submissions for her me YouTube Oh, I'm sorry, to her For Me YouTube charity channel. 
A link to the video is currently included in the low bar. Give it a watch after the show and see what you can do to help. Secondly, in Australia now, the statistics for male suicide is nearly all the demographics in all demographics are currently on the rise. The professionals are now advocating that we change the strategy of silence and try talking. <laughs> Crazy idea that. They are urging men who have tried suicide and survived to talk. But sadly, in our culture, people often switch off when this happens. But stories are different as are songs and poetry. Though through millennia, this is how we have communicated survival. Interestingly, when Northern Ireland was embroiled in the troubles, it spawned great plays, songs, poetry, and films. And yet their death rate was less than our suicide rate, which now stands at over eight a day. And our great loss spawns nothing. Same with the Afro-Americans and their endless struggles. Their pain gave, earth to, birth, gave birth to the blues. I believe it's time to use art to fight the silent epidemic. This is why I wrote Suicide Row. In its second reading, I stopped the actors halfway through and asked everyone to realize that they were laughing. And it wasn't an irresponsible laugh, but the play is, has funny moments because as humans, we breed humor as though humor was a tool we were given to survive the pain. And here we are laughing warmly in a play about suicide. We don't need more suicide awareness. As we all know, it's a grim and growing problem. We need to attack it head on with art pieces that motivate people not to take the final step. We need a journey into the darkness to try to reach down, reach the dawn that's on the other side. In fact, there might just be no other way. Suicide Row is powerful, but not bleak. It's funny, but it's not black comedy. It's about men who are suffering, but it manages to celebrate their beauty and resilience. It has politically incorrect moments, but it is not cruel. It's just four worn out Australian men rediscovering their hunger to live despite the confusing bullshit of our times. It's a beautiful story and please help us spread the word. There is a link to the play and the information around it also in the low bar. Give it a look after the show. So thanks for hanging around for my overly lengthy intro and uh, summary as well as the shilling. And now we're going to get into the stories. So first person to talk as I, I tend to like to give him the first swing is Max. You're going to tell us a little bit about Destiny. All right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, hail Hydra. And second of all, I believe before we go into this particular story, I think it's customary that uh, we all give a praise keck. Praise keck. Praise keck. Praise keck. All right. And uh, may keck be with you. The thing that and that's, what, that's, what, that's when you're supposed to say, and also with you, and if you're oh, Catholic. Uh, oh, okay. I'll say what I want to say. I don't really if you're what? what? Mike, you're really low, man. It's all right. Anyways, um, what did you say? If you're a Catholic, yeah, yeah. Well, no, isn't that what you like? Catholics yes. say at the beginning of yes, their sermon, actually. Okay. Except instead of keck, it's like may God be with you and also with you. Anyways, uh, we're not here to talk about religion. Uh, we're no, here to talk about an al alternative religion. So keck manifests in destiny. See what I did there. So my fellow Titans, Warlocks, and the obviously superior Hunters. Video game developer Bungie Studios released their newest title, Destiny 2, roughly two weeks ago. Now, despite the fact the title currently has 1.2 million concurrent players across all platforms, the title has received mixed reviews. Some praise its tight gunplay, its improved story and musical score. Others criticize its emphasis on grinding, the lack of innovation in the core gameplay, and the fact that they can't seem to get a flying vehicle into their game, despite the fact that you could fly a banshee in Bungie's most famous title, Halo, back in 2000 one <sighs> While all of these are valid comments, all of them are of such little importance to that particular crowd of gamers who believe everything is racist, everything is sexist, everything is homophobic, and what do you have to do, Brian? You have to point it all out. Goddamn. Right. Well, apparently eagle-eyed professional complainers noticed that a particular piece of armor in the game looks a lot like the logo on the Kekistani flag. Now, for those of you who don't know, Kekistan is a mythical fictional place where its denizens worship a frog god named Kek. I might be wrong about that. Please correct me in the comments if I am. Uh, Kekistan and its cor corresponding symbolism emerged from 4chan as a parody of Nazi ideology and imagery. However, to a lot of people, they don't seem to get the joke because 
the piece of armor has been deemed a quote unquote hate symbol that has been quote unquote repurposed by neo-Nazis, according to Ars Technica, but that's the sort of thing you'd expect from that website. Bungie quickly removed the armor and apologized. Oddly enough, the design has nothing to do with Kekistan or Kek and was originally created back in June of 2015. It is just a pure coincidence that both look so similar. But God, it, just, it looks so close, except for that like one line in where there's supposed to be an E, right? Well, while I think this is a stupid thing to get upset over because Kek and all of its surrounding imagery and meme magic is supposed to be a parody of white nationalism and white supremacy, I believe you know there, there's some valid other <laughs> valid opinions to consider. Has Keck been appropriated like the Nazis appropriated the swastika? And regardless of whether or not the answer is no, do we blame Bungie for bowing down to these people? Discuss. This is stupid. I know. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's all I have, really. It, it's really dumb that, uh, the, the, that this obvious parody of, uh, of a flag, specifically made to you know, to sort of like, um, to troll people, you know, uh, is being taken seriously. That, that's, I, I don't, I don't, it's just really dumb. And then Bungie would, because I know this stuff costs money, that they would spend the money to, to, um, to essentially do the programming work that's required to either remove the piece of armor completely or simply just redesign it to look different. Uh, it just seems like a really stupid waste of time. And, uh, like, how did they... Okay, here's another thing. I'm sure that when they put the stuff in, they were thinking about whatever their own kind of, you know, uh, logos were from their own uh, in-game, you know, or in-world, um, you know, fucking story or whatever. Whatever their, their world-building, yeah. their own mythos. Yeah, they just throw that in there it was just like you know when you play borderlands there are these made-up super corporations when you play other games that have them you'll see that and it's actually supposed to be you know give you the feeling that you're immersed in this world and that there's like companies and brands that exist and they use them you know uh the the fact that they they would have to feel the need to rebrand just based on the fact that it looks similar when it clearly isn't supposed to be it's just kind of a happy coincidence how did they even learn about this i wonder like did yeah. did a uh, did some SJW see it and they said, "Oh my God, do they realize what they're doing?" Like as though they were actually putting a swastika on it. And if they did actually put a swastika on it, would that really be the same as advocating that? Because that would mean that people who have made like World War II games where Nazis are in them and they wear swastikas and there are flags with swastikas on them, would that mean that those people are actually advocating that stuff? If you're playing a video game where you're fighting against communists and there's like. Um, you know, the hammer and sickle on there. Are you advocating that stuff? Like, I, I don't know why this is the response. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it's just really dumb and it's a waste of money. And it's, uh, it's all, it's also a dumb thing for Ars Technica to even report on. But considering that Ars Technica, if I remember correctly, was part of Gawker Media, it doesn't surprise yeah. me. And Kyle Orland wrote it to any yeah. of you guys who remember him back in Gamergate days. Uh, yeah, anyways, H Hannah, you were gonna say something? Yeah, I just you it's 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 really respectable as far as um the the trolling end of it goes to see how far <laughs> how far this has gone because I mean I I thought free bleeding was funny cuz so many feminists adopted it but this <laughs> it, this this is both great and terrible. I don't think any group of people in, at least in my lifetime, has been trolled this effectively. I don't think anybody's been trolled this effectively since the original broadcast, radio broadcast of War of the Worlds, and that was accidental. This was deliberate, <laughs> and and these people fell for it, picked it up, and ran with it, <laughs> and, and and then adopted it. And and now it's it's like uh, I don't know monkeys playing with poo that that pick it up and fling it at everybody and rub it on themselves. It's just it's sad and hilarious and a little horrifying and yeah it is a huge waste of time and money. It's yeah. actually gotten expensive now, but it all it's it's all it all goes all the way back to being <laughs> trolling. 
<laughs> yeah, it <laughs> I'm is. Sorry, but I, I can't stop laughing about it's that. It's so dumb. I, I want to. I wanted to also tell you something before you continue. Uh, for those of you guys who are watching, I'm using a different sort of chat interface to display. It is uh, something that compiles the chat from every place that we're streaming to. So I cannot ignore or accidentally or not see the the folks that are um, using Twitch, the folks that might be using uh, Ustream, the folks that might be using various other streaming services that we happen to be on, Facebook, whatever. So if you're on any of those platforms and you want to make comments, I will be able to see them and I'll be able to comment on them. But I have to do it like uh, live because I, I, to log in and do it, I'd have to log into every single account. So it's better if I just do it vocally. So if I see anything interesting, I may uh, come in and just say something. So Davey1602 said, no, I'm sorry, I got the wrong guy. Uh, Firebat47 said, all they did was remove the lettering from the armor, but it doesn't look as good though. And that's another thing I was thinking, like if you were somebody that, you know, got a piece of, uh, uh, in-game clothing or a weapon or whatever, just like a piece of equipment, an article for your character, which affects what your character looks like and everything, and then they change it, wouldn't that piss you off? I mean, like, if you liked it especially, um... Because I know yeah. from playing games that have customization options or armor and loot and stuff like that, if if uh, you get it and you think, oh, this looks cool, and you put it on, and then they change it, even if they change it to something that isn't as bad, I think that players are going to be kind of bummed out because it's not what they, you know, it's not what they originally uh, signed up for. So yeah. I, I think that that's uh, something else to point out. This could upset the uh, people who bought, you know, who either bought this piece of armor or they found it somewhere. Um, and this is going to turn into a Streisand effect, too, because people who are wearing that piece of armor really liked it and then had it taken away are inadvertently going to learn about the, the wonderful land that is Kekistan and praise Kek until the end of their days. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then lastly, somebody else said, man, War of the Worlds was top fucking Kek. And I think that he's... <laughs> that's... that's a... <laughs> That's actually, around back then? Uh, yeah, top, Keck was around. He's always been with us, Max. And, God and, bless Orson and, Welles. Yeah, Orson Welles, he, he made it possible. And I think that's actually a good point to make because uh, for those of you guys who may not know, uh, War of the Worlds was a fake um, radio broadcast. It was basically a story that was done in the form of a radio broadcast that appeared legit, done by Orson Welles, about an alien invasion. And it freaked everybody out because they thought it was really happening. It was basically a hoax. It was a huge troll. But it was super effective, and it's actually um, something that people uh, remember to this day. So yeah. yeah, it was actually it was such a big deal that it's referenced in movies that are set during that time period. Where I, I can't remember the scene, uh, the, the or the movie that, that the scene is from, but there's one that comes to mind where uh, this couple is out on a date, and the, they turn on their radio, and the broadcast is playing, and the guy like just bolts out of the car and runs off because he hears he hears that aliens have invaded. Um, and like that kind of panic happened all over. So, but it, it was, it was such a, a widespread thing. And it was so funny that, that, and so, uh, much of an impact on, um, on, on, on society at that moment that, uh, yeah, it's, it's referenced in other stories now that are set in that time period. Yeah, so I mean, uh, in closing, I guess, because uh, we should get to the rest of these stories. Max, did you want to say something else? Yeah, just one very quick thing, because you brought up something in respect to the resources that they put forward to take this piece of armor out of the game. I, I can't believe how fast they were able to do this. What, in less than two weeks since the game's release? I can't believe that they're able to do that so quickly without being able to fix such very, very simple things with Destiny 2. Like, oh, I don't know, maybe being able to select the fucking uh, strikes you know, the individual strikes instead of having to go through a playlist and having to drop and people are dropping out all the goddamn time because you, they want to do a particular strike. Or how about the fact that, uh, you know, that be, you can't go beyond 260. It's almost impossible to get beyond 265 unless you go and do the fucking raid and you have to go online. And you have to go to the Destiny Tracker to get people to come on and then they all suck. It's a fucking miracle. Anyways. No, that sounds, damn it. those things sound really hard, Max. <laughs> First world problem. And, and, but, but, but if you but if you remove the Kekistani what what appears to be a Kekistani flip symbol from a piece of armor, and then you go online and you proudly proclaim that you did it because you don't support uh, white supremacy or whatever the fuck they think that this is, uh, it, it's actually a lot easier to get people to like you, I guess, to do that than it is to like actually improve the game 
that people yeah. fucking paid for. Hey, Bungie, when Anthem comes out in the next few months, you guys are going to get anus raped. Yeah. Honestly. Because that game looks like it's fucking kick-ass. It looks like everything that Destiny should have been back in 2014, okay? So get your act together and put your resources towards something that matters, okay? God, remember Halo Reach? Did you ever play Halo Reach? No, no, no. Oh. no. Guys, anybody who's ever played Halo Reach, you know what I'm talking about. The customization in that game was fucking amazing. It actually meant something if you got something like inclement weather uh, armor effects for your helmets or you got like that um, grenadier uh, chess piece. That was a big deal. And they can't even seem to get the most bare minimum aspect of trying to... You know, get your customization right, your aesthetics for your character. Fucking single use shaders? Are you kidding? <laughs> you can tell how passionate I am. No, I, <laughs> I didn't. I didn't play a lot of Halo. I didn't have a. I had the first Xbox, so I only had like the first two Halos, and mm. that was it. Um, but I, I, I'm I, done. <laughs> I do. I get it. Uh, and and also on the other side of the coin, uh, these folks they are completely humorless. The the people who report on this. What is up? They're so out of touch with the internet culture. It's actually the reason why you guys are going to keep losing. Losing at everything because you don't understand internet culture. And it's a shame because these people are moving on without you. So, anyway, moving on to the next story. You're sad. Sad. Uh, all right. Everstream, Evergreen State College settles with Brett Weinstein. It's Weinstein. Pretty sure it's Weinstein. Brett Weinstein the widely known Evergreen State biology professor who protested changes to Evergreen's day of absence, filed a tort claim against Evergreen State College. Weinstein and his wife filed a $3.85 million claim against Evergreen after it had permitted, cultivated, and perpetuated a racially hostile and retaliatory work environment. In, the, in their claim, they stated that, quote, through a series of decisions made at the highest levels, including to officially support a day of racial segregation, the college has refused to protect its employees from repeated provocative and corrosive verbal and written hostility based on race, as well as threats of physical violence. End quote. Brett Weinstein faced enormous black backlash from students, as well as other faculty, for fighting against Evergreen's change to the day of absence. In previous years, the day of absence was a day in which non-white faculty and students did not go to campus in order to raise awareness about the contributions of minorities and spark a conversation <laughs> right, about ra racial issues at Evergreen. This past school year, faculty at Evergreen made changes and strongly implied that white students and faculty would not be welcome on campus and instead should attend an event at an off-campus location. After denouncing the change in format, Brett Weinstein showed up to campus and was met with verbal and physical harassment from students, many of whom were being directed by Evergreen faculty members. In the months following, he was faced with imminent threats to his safety and was told by campus police that they could not guarantee his safety if he showed up on campus. Because of these series of events, Brett Weinstein and his wife filed their tort claim. In the end, they settled with the school for only $500,000 only, compared to the $3.85 that they had asked. John Carmichael, the chief of staff and secretary to Evergreen's board of trustees, said that, quote, This agreement is in the best interests of Evergreen. Years of expensive and time-consuming litigation would not help us achieve our mission, end quote. However, Carmichael also said that in making this agreement, the college admits no liability and rejects the allegations made in the tort claim. Yeah, fuck you. While Evergreen did not admit fault in the case of this specific claim, Evergreen's reputation has already been damaged because of the administration's shoddy handling of the entire situation surrounding Brett Weinstein and Evergreen's day of absence. So apparently their mission is to make people with different racial backgrounds feel totally separated from each other and not get along. It would seem to be that by, by being inclusive, I guess, uh, they're, they're, well, I, it, yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it just, it strikes me that like, cause that's what this seems to be designed to achieve. So clearly like what they've done here. If it's any indication of their mission, their mission is to be as divisive as humanly possible and prevent wounds from past conflict from ever healing. Yep. 
that's, I mean, that's all I can get out of, of of their behavior. It doesn't seem like it's uh, intended to – the idea of sparking a conversation, but the people that are trying to have the conversation aren't there, or the people that you're trying to have the conversation with can't be there, it's kind of dumb. Uh, and, and on top of it, it's, again, a divisive thing. And you know, it just it just really strikes me as counterproductive the way they're doing this. Bottom line, Evergreen, you know you messed up when you allowed your students to tell a Jewish man that he couldn't go somewhere on account of the way that he was born. Okay, mm -hmm. it's your fault. And got you know we can talk about you know whether Brett Weinstein's particular politics might have had. Uh, his own hand in creating the culture that we have now. But in respect to what he has gone through and the fact that he has become an advocate for free speech, good on you, man. Congratulations. I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm hoping that there is a shift happening, but um, I, I can't help that. Uh, but to point out that he was he did kind of help create this monster and he's sort of dealing with the outcome of that and i hope that he learns something from that experience because the uh i mean that's just the that's just the truth of it i mean he, he, this is a, a beast that he made so uh, even though he's his views were less i guess less extreme um i get that that must be what you know the difference is uh he, he did contribute to this he was a part of that uh he even though he was a biology professor and he had like some, I guess he has some background with, uh, you know, um, evolutionary biology. Um, if you watch, there was a very long Joe Rogan podcast that I watched with Brett Weinstein and Jordan B. Peterson and Joe Rogan. It was mostly just uh, Weinstein and Peterson talking. And I know if you watch that, you'll see that Weinstein's um, uh, personal politics are still uh, very much like in many ways they're still on the progressive side, you know. And and when I say progressive, I don't mean really progressive. I mean he puts people into you know groups according to the progressive stack. He believes in the systems of oppression. He believes in all these things. He just thinks that what's going on in Evergreen uh, on every Evergreen College has gone. It's gone a little too far. It's it's like those people that say, oh, you know, I'm a feminist. But um, I don't like the new third wave feminism. I'm a bigger fan of the second wave feminism or whatever. You know, I believe that that's, that's good enough. And this is the same. He does the same thing. So, again, that doesn't mean that I don't think that he deserves justice. That doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not glad that, you know, he's starting to maybe see the fallout of that. But there are a couple things that are important to point out. One is... You know, his politics haven't shifted that much. He just doesn't consider himself as extreme. And secondly, he didn't uh, seem to take an issue with any of this stuff until it started to affect him personally. And I think that's also something that's worth pointing out. In the meantime, the college obviously um, bears, the college as an institution bears much more of the blame. And I'm not trying to make like, um, uh, you know, a, a case for the, the college because they're obviously the bigger part of the problem as in fact, most of academia is. Now, I would I would also point out um, it's a positive sign, at least that he didn't like a lot of people that are of the the uh, progressive stack wielding social justice warrior end of the political spectrum. When they become the target of their own politics, they mm -hmm. they turn into these self flagellating, self sacrificing ninnies, and uh, he didn't he didn't go that route. Um, and I think it's it the fact that he not only didn't go that route, but that he actually stood up uh, and and opposed what was happening to him. It may not necessarily be you know great as in terms of uh, you know a big change from him or a sudden epiphany or realization, but at the very least, it's a sign that in in society you can do that. You, you can. You know, turn around and say no. I, I won't put up with this, and fight back, and at least on a small level, win. Even though the college doesn't admit guilt, they still had to shell out quite a bit of money there, uh, more money than I'll probably ever see in my life. So, uh, yeah, there is that. He didn't. He didn't go the the. Uh, I'm I'm a terrible person. Shame on me for existing. You're right. I shouldn't be here. Route. 
he he actually did something about it. And he seems like, including everything that you said uh, and about his appearance on Jogan, at least he seems very open to hearing opposing points of view and putting forward a, a thought out argument, even though you, know, you and I can disagree with him. Yeah, yeah. So I think, and he's also buddy buddy with Jordan Peterson, it seems right now. So he seems to be on his way to, uh, you know, quote, I guess you can say, for lack of a better term, red pilling himself. Uh, but yeah, I, I, for those reasons, I sort of have to. Uh, be more on uh, yeah. the good side of things and more optimistic. I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily being pessimistic, but I guess this reminds me of, and again, this isn't, like, I'm, I agree with what you're saying. Like, you know, I'm glad mm-hmm. that he's open to conversations. I'm glad that he's willing to discuss these things with, with uh, you know, um, uh, Jordan Peterson and anybody else. It would seem that this, this experience essentially pushed him on this journey, right? This experience. And I'm reminded, in a way, of, of Lacey Green and what happened with her when she started dating Chris Reagan. And while on the, it's a little, I'm, I'm feeling it's a mixed bag for me, because on the one hand, I'm glad that Lacey Green has decided to, you know, start to talk to people, I, although I don't know if she's done anything lately, because I don't, I don't subscribe to her. Um, I'm, op- I'm glad that she's open to talking to people and trying to, uh, you know, hash out the, the, the stuff that's going on with anti-feminists and what they're saying. And with other people who essentially criticize feminism for whatever reason and her own personal views. And he's going on that journey. But having said that, I don't give her as much praise as others do because there are other things that she has not done. Which yeah. I think that Jordan Peterson, among, and I'm just using him as an example, but I believe that before you can start on a journey uh, intellectually and philosophically – uh, where you have conversations with people who you disagree with, who have criticized you in the past, whatever, who have v- valid or invalid criticisms, that you're willing to take a step outside of your ideology and really examine it for what's working and what's not and, and allow that stuff to be, you know, to, to the chips to fall wherever they may once you have, like, you know, gone through that process. I think that it's, it's you can't really start it unless you're willing to look at the stuff that you have done before that and actually look at like how much of that is wrong. Like you can't, you can't. Um, for example, in Lacey Green's case, she she has essentially put. The, remember when Sargon apologized to her for what his fans did? Okay, um, it, and it wasn't even that bad. Like, but Sargon felt the need to do it anyway, so he did. Now I know that Sargon was extending an olive branch, and I don't fault him for that, even though I wouldn't have done it myself. The reason why I wouldn't have done it myself is because I don't feel that I'm responsible for what. Our fans do. That's like that was a thing that was happening with Baring and uh, Christy Winters, right? Where his he's got like four hundred thousand subs, and they're you know individual free agents to do whatever they want, and maybe some of them go to Christy Winters and they call her mean names, or they criticize her, or they disagree with her, and she calls it harassment, and she insists that this is Baring's responsibility. It's the same thing with Sargon and Lacey. Now that I I I didn't mind that he did it because I get it, but at the same time. Even though Lacey ex- put forward a tearful ac- acceptance of his apology, she never once, never once, went and and um, looked at the stuff that she's done to find out what she could do, which is things like she called all Republicans rape apologists. All of them. That's like half of the population of the United States, okay? That's a terrible thing to accuse them of. She has um, said... What was it else? Oh, she said, uh, fuck you, white America. And when, then, when she went on um, uh, Dave Rubin and he mentioned that to her, he asked her if she stood by that. She had a chance right there to say, you know what? I was emotional at that time and I was upset about the result of the election. That, that's understandable because I'm pretty sure that's what it was. But no, she said, I stand by that. So that hasn't changed. So th- there's things that when I see that, I think to myself, you know, I appreciate that you're going on this journey, you're trying to figure out the truth, but there are things that you haven't dealt with that you've done that I think you should deal with because I can't take you seriously if you don't. And with um, Brett Weinstein, I get a little bit of that. It's not to the same extent, but I, I get a little bit of that because I'm not seeing him say, you know, this, uh, this progressive politics stuff, I did have a part to play in some capacity. And I think that I'm going to have to, like, really go and, like, think about this stuff. Now, that doesn't mean that I, 
I that that's not the same as him essentially throwing out his ideology, but at least looking at the stuff that is, you know, you can't say, well, my stu the students have become more extreme than I would have believed if you don't think that you didn't contribute to that in any way. Like they mm -hmm. didn't come to the school with those beliefs, you know, th that was put in them by you or your colleagues um, and, and other faculty. So you, you have to like, at, at some point, you gotta take personal responsibility. That's what's missing. The personal yeah. responsibility is what is missing, and that's the bit that um, that puts me uh, on the on the less you know like, like slightly uh, let's put let's say cautiously um, optimistic. Where I'd like to see the change, but I'm not seeing that personal responsibility, that owning up to what you had done or how what your part to play was in creating this monster. And instead, yeah. I'm just seeing a lawsuit, and it's like, well, I'm going to get three point eight something million dollars because I feel slighted, and oh, I only got five hundred thousand. Boo hoo! But you know, like if we're, we're talking about fixing problems, then I, I think there's I'm calling for some integrity here. So yeah. never, never hold your breath on something like that because there's, especially in the United States, um, it, there are there's something that is uh, it's not just entirely specific to here, but it's it's fairly specific to here. Where there are certain areas for which uh, people are accustomed to not having to take personal responsibility, and one of them is their past political opinions. Uh, and you know, on the Lacey Green front, it's that's that goes double because she's a girl. And uh, you know, I, I'm sure that there's there's people going to be saying, "Oh, you're just being tough on her because she's a girl." No, I'm I'm a girl. I know this because I have not been held to the same standard as guys have in terms of past fuck ups uh and i know it and that's that's something that um well the, the best way to put it is this you know i i've i've talked about uh people people asking me you know uh have you always been have you always been a woman have you always been a woman and you know and, they, and that's one of the one of the ways they ask it you know did you ever used to be a guy have you always been a well no i haven't always been a woman i used to be a little girl and then i grew up and it took me a longer time than it should have. And that's part of the problem. Some girls grow up to be women. Some girls get older all of their lives and they get to the age of Hillary Clinton and they're still children or they're still very much like the responsibility level of a teenage boy. And uh, because of that, you have this situation where you're you're not expected by the people around you to take personal responsibility for your past behavior, for self-examination, for your own decision-making and so on, to train you to consistently do that and to have an inclination to do it. If you don't have uh, that inclination on your own, or if you're not led to that inclination through observation, if somebody doesn't uh, yell at you for not having that inclination or life doesn't kick your ass because you don't have that inclination, you don't develop it. And, and that's just the way it is. Um, and in, in the United States, we have such a, a, a plethora of safety nets for people, both in terms of, of wealth and social safety nets, that I think we grow up with a much less harsh school of hard knocks for a lot of people in a lot of ways than people in some other countries in terms of taking personal responsibility. And it's very noticeable. The first place I really noticed it was when I went to college and some of the international students just seemed at the same age as the rest of us. They seemed as mature as my parents. It was a very stark difference. And it was because where they grew up, their society, not just their, their environment, but their society had a much more harsh set of rules that, that dealt with personal accountability. And so they were quicker to, um, when, when it was called for, when it was right for them to do it, they were quicker to apologize. They were quicker to offer to fix something that they had screwed up. They were quicker to, to offer to chip in if they were in a, a group of people that wanted to go do something that costs money, even if they had less money to do it. They were quicker to offer to pitch in and work. They were quicker to offer to help if somebody was down on their luck, you know. So, and this, this, this was, 
clear back, you know, in, in, in the early 90s, when I was 18, 19 years old, figuring this out, and I felt kind of embarrassed for being that different from them. Um, and I think a lot of people don't figure that out. But I think what we find, what we found with our, our divisiveness in the United States, what we're dealing with in terms of people having these experiences where there's an obvious lesson in the experience and they don't pick it up and they go through this agonizing journey from blue pill to red pill, if they ever get to red pill, um, it's, it's partly because it's alien for, for Americans to take that degree of personal responsibility for being wrong in their politics that quickly. And it's, it's almost like there needs to be another, like we, we talk about red pill, we talk about blue pill, and we talk about purple pill being that sort of space in between. It's like there needs to be another step between the purple pill and the blue pill, you know, like an indigo pill that you get stuck on before you start through the purple journey. And it, it seems to me that, that uh, both of the people under discussion are in that indigo stage. And a lot of people never get out of it. Um, so I'm not holding my breath that they will. I, I'm not saying there's no hope that they will. But, uh, you know, I, I don't hold my breath on stuff like that. Never hold yeah. your breath on something like that because you never know, especially with an American, because we're spoiled. Right. And it's not necessarily all bad that we're spoiled. That's a sign of, of, of plenty, basically. Yeah. I don't. There are consequences for it. Right. I, I don't really have uh, really an expectation that there'd be a great deal of humility that would come out of this and any of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't really care that much. It, it really comes down to what your actions are. So, you know, if, if, uh, if, if Weinstein takes up the, you know, um, do, he's doing the stuff that he's doing and I admire that and he's having the conversations and he's going to challenge his beliefs and, you know, maybe he's going to, he'll also challenge ours. I'm, I'm open to that too. Uh, then I think that that's all great. Um, I want to read some people who made comments. Uh, some of them said stuff specifically to what I said. Sarah Jessica Farter says, she only made a fucking tweet, I guess is referencing Lacey Green. If folk can't handle re reading a tweet that they, they, they don't like, they can fuck off. Well, thing is, um, the, the point about it is to, the, the reason why people were responding to the tweet isn't because it offended them or triggered them or they couldn't handle it when Lacey insulted uh, white America on her, when she lost, you know, when, when her, her woman lost the election, or when she made her videos on Brawless, where she basically called all Republicans rape Republicans, which essentially is saying they're all rape apologists because reasons. People are specifically talking about that because Lacey views herself or viewed herself at the time as a pillar of tolerance and love and equality and all this other stuff and this is counter to that it's basically uh comes from a lack of um how do i put this a lack of compassion for your opponents and the the fact is you cannot claim to be compassionate if you aren't compassionate universally which she isn't it also shows that if you switch things around according to her logic then if you change some elements in her statements they become uh, bigoted statements. So it's sort of like, you know, if you were to say, um, you know, fuck you, white America, if I made a tweet saying, fuck you, black America, or if a white guy did, or whatever, you know, then that, that wouldn't go over very well, right? That would be something that she would have a problem with. This isn't really because people are upset, but they're basically just pointing out that what she's doing or what she did is hypocritical and it's hateful. I mean, it's angry and it's hateful. And if you claim to not be a hateful person, then these are not the things that you do. It just shows that you're a hypocrite. So when people point it out, that's what they point out. And, and maybe when um, uh, Dave Rubin asked her, she still stood by that. He wanted to know if her position on things had changed at all as a result of essentially reaching out and dating Chris Reagan and all this stuff. It was basically like, okay, so now that you have, you know, um, started this journey and all the people that you supposedly loved you well not all of them but a bunch of them turned on her like the feminists and stuff has your positions shifted on anything like do you think that maybe you were a bit harsh when you said that and and she didn't she said no i i don't i i don't take it back at all so she could have just been doubling down which sjw's always do but 
I think that it's worth pointing out because it does say something to her character. This is what is worth pointing out. As far as okay, so that that's the reason why I said that. I mean, you guys could feel oh. feel free to add on to that if you want to, but that's where I was coming from. There is something to point out um, that that's more recent than that. And I mean, because like I, I hate to um, I hate to see people I hate to see people get upset about Lacey not being being considered fully red pilled. Okay, it's she's not a football. She's she's a person, and people make mistakes, and they can be wrong. You know, I I, I can be wrong about things. Okay, any of us can be wrong about things. Um, and, and one of the clues as to where she stands was her reaction to Betsy DeVos. She's one of the people that got very upset, uh, about Betsy DeVos's statement. And, uh, that, that kind of tells you she wasn't paying attention to both sides of that issue. She wasn't, she didn't even hear what Betsy actually said. Her her tweets about that were all talking points and she didn't I didn't see her respond to any of the uh, counter arguments people gave her for those now I don't know I don't watch your videos um, but so she might have said something different on YouTube but she didn't she's definitely not red pilled because somebody who was red pilled would at least have looked at the the uh, articles that DeVos referenced, the cases that DeVos referenced, and realize that yes, there is a problem. The problem affects both uh, uh, both types of victims, you know, victims uh, of actual misconduct and victims of false accusations, which aren't labeled misconduct but should be. Um, and that's you know, that to me that tells me she's not red pilled. Uh, it tells me that she's She's wanting people to see her as someone who is open-minded, but that's why I keep saying, you know, it, it don't hold your breath, and and it's why I mentioned that that indigo pill thought. It's the only um, way I can think of off the top of my head to express it. She hasn't quite started the journey yet. She's 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 you know steps outside the house, but she's nowhere near the big SUV that that's going to take her down the road. From from blue pill to red pill hadn't happened yet, um, and there's nothing wrong with admitting that. It's not uh, about being angry at her; it's about being realistic. Uh, other things. Uh, so I got two more comments, and there's some other ones that are related to this. Uh, John Chalkley said, "Gotta be honest, Brian. I don't think you understood Brett's position at all." And Evildoer said, I don't think Weinstein or Weinstein is half as bad as you're saying. I've watched all of his interviews, and he seems to have always been for equal opportunity, for example. No, I'm, it's not that bad. No, I, I, I don't. I, I mean, look, I'm open to that being the case. I'm just going by what I've seen um, in the first. I remember the very first interview I saw him on. What was the first place he appeared after this whole thing broke out? Carlson. Was it C Tucker Carlson? Yeah, I think it was on that. Um and at that time, I was listening to him, and I got the impression that he was uh, very much... He's actually admittedly a progressive. Now, he may not be as far out there, is, which is what I said. He may not be as far out there as like the kind of students that are being produced, the kind of stuff that we see. He's not a Melissa Click, for example, you know, but... I mean, he's not like bike lock guy. But, um, so I'm not saying that. But I question whether or not he did contribute to this... Um, to this climate in some way. And maybe his positions have actually shifted even, you know, because some people said that, that he's, he's actually talked about this stuff before he was personally affected by it. And that may be true and I'm open to that as a possibility. So I don't, I don't pretend to know exactly where Weinstein or Weinstein is at. I'm just going by what I've seen in the interviews that I've seen. So take that, take that for what it is. Be vigilant for all the reasons that Hannah and Brian list, uh, listed. But going forward, don't hold, do your best to not hold this stuff over their head. Otherwise, you're risking just pushing them away and not, yeah. you know, uh, having I'll, them become open. Definitely, I'm like, you know, let them, uh, you know, find their own way. I'm open to, like, let, let Lacey Green, this is her journey. Same thing with Brett, you know, uh, we'll see. And I hope that this continues 
these conversations continue. So that's basically what it's what it's going to take. All right. So I'm going to go on to the next story. The Road to Ruin. Cambridge PhD student Matthew Barron has been cleared of assault charges after his then fiancée, fiance, sorry, Sophia Cook claimed that he punched her in the arm and face as well as smashed her car radio and smartphone. The incident occurred during an argument in which Cook revealed that she had cheated on Barron during a trip to Ecuador. During the trial, Cook maintained that Barron had assaulted her and damaged her property. Barron did admit to shaming her car radio and smartphone, but denied laying hands on Cook. I'm, I'm guessing that shaming is like he damaged it. Uh, smashed, not shamed. <laughs> that would be weird. Shame on you, radio and smartphone. Barron told the court that he, the claims of assault were revenge for him calling off the wedding plans due to Cook's infidelity. Derp. Barron said that Cook wanted to ruin him, stating that she told him, quote, If you tell anyone that I've cheated on you, I will ruin you. I will tell everyone that you have been a violent monster. In the end, the court des decided to side with Barron, calling Cook's story inconsistent and not credible. However, Barron was convicted of criminal damage and was handed a conditional discharge of 12 months, as well as being ordered to pay 620 pounds in court costs, including 300 pounds in compensation. Cook will not face any criminal charges. So, anybody have any thoughts on that story? Well, hell, Cook's the abuser in that situation. Yeah. I mean, from the start, too... And the only reason to tell somebody you cheated on them, if if you you haven't put them at risk for a disease, and you're not leaving them for somebody that other people are going to tell them you cheated with, the only reason to inflict that information on them is for your own interests, to 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 make yourself feel better, to 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 beg forgiveness, or or to hurt them. And no matter what your goal is, the last bit is is going to be the main result and you know unless you have for their own physical health as a legitimate reason to tell the person it's abusive to tell somebody that you cheated on them it just is and so she started the whole thing right there by mm -hmm. saying it and and then threatening him with it like that and what did she expect that, that this guy was going to, you know, to, going to do. I mean, did she expect that he was just going to take it and, and walk away? You know, maybe some people do that. Maybe some people uh, put up with, with basically being kicked in the balls like that. But a lot of people become very angry when they get, get told something like that all of a sudden. It was totally inappropriate for him to destroy her property sarah but, sarah, you know what? sarah jessica farter real quick she says uh i'd rather let i'd rather that my partner told me that they cheated on me i'd want to know i mean i'd rather they don't cheat at all i don't yeah, know I'd rather they don't cheat at all <laughs> but I, if they do and, and, and they tell honestly, you about it um you have to wonder like what is the goal why of did that? you tell me this yeah. yeah you know i as far as like i'm i'm the kind of person that would rip off the scab too but it would still, the only reason to tell me would be to hurt me, unless I had a risk that I had to know about. Um, and I've, I've watched people that I love and care about find that information out live. And um, it's very hard to control your temper when you see somebody go through that. Just, just seeing somebody that you're protective of going through that. And I, you know, so I can understand why it might be hard for for somebody who is in the midst of it to control his temper. Mm -hmm. um, when you're hurt, your first self-defense against that pain when you're hurt that way is to get angry. You know, and it's it's just an absolutely stupid, rotten, shitty thing to do all around. The act of cheating itself is abusive. It's a betrayal. A betrayal is abusive. You know, um, if you're done, done being with somebody and you're going to be with somebody else Just in the relationship, in the relationship first. Yeah. And if you can't do that, 
then don't be with the other person. It's not that hard. If you're going to be monogamous, be monogamous. If you're not going to be monogamous, be open about it. Be honest. That's it. But no, I, I honestly, out of all of this, you know, it, it's one of the few times it's, it's understandable to completely lose your shit is when somebody who's, who's loyal to you're led to believe you can trust the person that you are led to believe is, is the one you can trust the most in the world. It betrays you like that. Um, not that it's okay to be violent under that circumstance. No. Just that it's understandable. Understanding and approval are not the same thing for anyone listening for something to cherry pick. Um, and so it's it's not wrong that he was convicted of criminal damage because he did it. But it's very wrong that she's not facing any charges. She filed a false charge and she was abusive too. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's... If if they're gonna go um, after um, him for what destroying uh, a car radio, yeah, and a cell that's phone, it, and a smartphone yeah. that he could he could replace, then then they ought to go after her for that too. That actually uh, brings uh, you you actually kind of answered it in your statement, but but uh, someone was saying you know why wouldn't you want to know? It's it, and I guess the uh, my my question would be maybe there's something to think about. Okay. Um, and, and Hannah basically answered it, but I'm just putting it out there for everybody else that's here, like Max and stuff. If your partner goes on a trip, because she went on a trip, or whatever, if she's cheating on you, if she cheats on you, or if he cheats on you, as the case may be, and they come back and they tell you they did it, um, is that better or worse than if you find out later through someone else so in some other means like either on your own or um through a third party or maybe through the through the person that they're cheating with well there's another thing um finding out that somebody's cheated would ruin every memory that comes out of the relationship everything every mm-hmm. happy moment and that would include memories of things that were activities with groups of people your family your your other friends and everything where your ex was part of that uh, for a long time, if not for your whole life, yeah, you know, and it's I, like I've had that happen with minor things, you know, had that happen with favorite favorite uh, entertainers. The most recent one, okay, it was only a handful of my schoolmates, but I was bullied as viciously as Carrie from Stephen King's novel Carrie, mm-hmm. and I. Like, and it was some of the stuff that was in that book, some of the same things or things that were eerily similar were done to me. Did you have pig's blood poured on your head? Did I have what? Did you have pig's blood poured on your head? No, that was one that that didn't quite get there. But I had numerous other things that I'm like, holy shit, you know, this this guy's reaching into my head. Um, And that's that was one of of three pieces of uh, works of entertainment that have have meant a lot to me since I um, since the first time I experienced them because they involved um, the repercussions of of rage and like when I was growing up it was the Incredible Hulk uh, the, the the Hulk was something that you know was what my dad sort of got me hooked on because I always had a struggle with my temper and then then um, <laughs> There was there was the other two or both Stephen King creations. There was Carrie and there was Firestarter, and the the struggles to to control the temper, in order to control the fire and Firestarter really hit home. And, and then the other day he comes out and demonstrates a complete inability to deal with humor that comes from a, a the wrong side of the political fence, and it was just I was disgusted. I'm like, this is not this is not the person that wrote the wisdom that I gleaned from those books, the observations that I was able to make from those books that that touched on my battle with my temper. And it's just it's very frustrating, right? And that's minor. 
but it actually kept me awake <laughs> when I was the only chance I got to sleep in the last 24 hours. Yeah. And, and that's not even like, I have no connection directly whatsoever with this author. Okay. There's nothing, you know, just that I've read his books and, and mm -hmm. happened to be touched by this. Imagine that's a minor thing. Imagine the impact something as big as that degree of intimacy that you have with the person. This is a fiance. This isn't just a, a girlfriend, right? They were going to get married. This was somebody that this guy planned on being with for the rest of his life. And uh, he, he, this is the most trusted person in his life did this to him. Right. Wanting to know that just for the sake of wanting to know is dangerous. Well, then, and then it begs the question, like, you know, why did she tell him? I wonder, because if, if she, if, if after telling him he damaged her property out of frustration, I wonder if it didn't happen because she was angry at him for some reason. Um, that happens. It, it, like, they got into a fight, right? And then she said, you know what? You know, I, I, I sucked you know, 50 dicks on my, on my way to the parking lot just a little while ago or whatever it is, 36 dicks. Um, and uh, <laughs> I just want to get the number right. But, you know, you do that to throw that in the face of the other person. And I know that when, yeah. you know, when women argue, they can get, when, when they want to insult a guy, they can really, they know how, where to hit them, where it's like, the mo does the most damage. So it could have been a fight that they got into. And then she said, I did this thing. And then he responded, by annulling the marriage, which of course made her angrier. And then she escalated and say, well, I'm going to tell people that you beat me, which is how we got to this point. So clearly there was something wrong with this woman from the beginning. And, uh, cause a, the, a person that would do that is not somebody you want to be with. And unfortunately the, the person that's going to, uh, suffer the most in the long run is that this guy's future relationships are going to be tainted by this relationship, which he was apparently ready to tie the knot with this person. So this was such a, probably destroyed his trust in women for a while. And he's going to need a lot of time to heal. And it's going to make it very difficult for him to trust, you know, again, especially if he like meets another girl, she could be perfect, right? In every way. And if she says, oh, I want to go on a trip somewhere, he's probably going to be like, I don't want you to go. Because he's not going to know if this person could like, you know, just fuck him over again you know i think it's just going to be something he's gonna to have to carry so, but worse than that is every other man that this woman gets involved with in the future and probably every man that she's been involved with before so there's definitely some toxicity here that needs to be addressed on her part and um it's left a mark on this guy and maybe this guy's got problems too because he was like you know destroying property and stuff so he probably has some anger issues that he has to work out um, but then again, these are kind of extreme circumstances. So at least I think so. If you were, if you have a fiance and she cheats on you, um, yeah, that's, that, that's something that I don't even have experience with. So I yeah. couldn't tell you how I'd feel about it. Well, honestly, if, if your fiance is female and she cheats on you and you want to hit back, the best way to do it is to not demonstrate in the least that you've been affected at all. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Hmm. Well, it was nice knowing you, and walk yeah, away. That's how you that, do it. You act like you don't that, care, and that actually burns their ass. That don't. would get well. And, and women's egos are so. If, if this is something that that happened with the ex, um, she she was absolutely livid. She left. She went off with another guy. She was gonna. You know, she's still married to him, but she was absolutely livid. When, when my husband and I got together, even though she was done, she was out of the relationship. She didn't want anything to do with him anymore. She didn't want him to, to not want her anymore. And, and it was a, a, it's a huge hit to the female ego. If a guy is able to get over her. Um, and it, it just, it's like it, the, the deepest hit you could, the hardest hit you could deliver is is to not be to not be hurt to not uh or to look like you're not hurt you know okay well i this is nice knowing you bye and and that's it and if she can't if she can't tell that you're hurt and she doesn't feel like you're devastated that that it's over that'll cut her 
deeper than anything you could do, anything else you could do. Yep. Even if, if you cheated on her with another woman, you couldn't, you couldn't cut her that deep. Yep. Okay, so let's go on to the next story. Uh, Brian, yeah. before we start this story, can I just do one quick thing, please? Yes. What? What was that? Girl's theme song. <laughs> Here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So, yeah, Powerpuff Girls. Um, when this was on Cartoon Network back in the day, it was actually a really great show. I actually liked Powerpuff Girls quite a lot. And then they rebooted it. And, uh, yeah, it didn't really... Something about it just didn't talk to me very well. But uh, they've been, it looks like they've been trying new ways to make the show appealing. I don't know how popular it is right now. It just didn't seem to be my cup of tea anymore. However, we have an article here for the latest thing that they tried to change. So, Powerpuff's newest fluff. The original Powerpuff Girls was a staple of the late 1990s era of Cartoon Network cartoons. Many fans were thrilled when it was announced that the show would be coming back in the form of a reboot in 2016. Those same fans were much less thrilled when the new show featured poor quality writing, the overuse of stale memes, and twerking. What? Apparently twerking. Yes. Meanwhile, in current year, the show is still making waves by introducing a new fourth girl to the roster. Blistina, also known as Bliss, made her debut in the last episode. While similar in appearance to the other girls, Bliss differs somewhat significantly. Her darker skin has led many to consider that she is the first black Powerpuff girl, or at least a Powerpuff girl of color. She also has electric blue hair. Your hair is blue. As well as longer legs and more pronounced hips. The explanation for that being that she is older than the other three girls. Many fans have criticized Bliss's appearance, stating that she seems closer to poor quality fan art rather than an official character. I've actually seen in comment section under, under this uh, the clips you can find on YouTube about Bliss that people say, this is my OC, please do not steal. <laughs> when the... <laughs> When the Bliss's departure at the end of the latest episode um, is unknown at this time, oh, I'm sorry, with the Bliss's departure at the end of this latest episode, it is unknown at this time if she will make any more appearances in future episodes. So TVLine.com has actually titled an article, the one that I use as uh, the main source, as Fourth Powerpuff Girl Revealed, Meet Townsville's First Black Crime Fighter. But if you watch the clips, there is actually no evidence to suggest that she is black other than the fact that her skin is darker. But other than that, there's, there really isn't anything to go on. She could simply be a girl with a tan. She could be uh, from anywhere else. But for some reason, they insist that she's black. She's Latinx, Brian. She could be Latinx. She could be. It's, uh, it's a really good thing they didn't name her Lilith. She could be one of those, you know, like in Japan, they have those girls that get tans and uh they, they they do like the colored light hair i don't even know what it is it's like a thing they do in japan where they like bronze themselves and they get really dark it's actually like a fashion thing she could be doing that she's a teenager yeah. or could at be. least almost a teenager she seems to uh be she's older than the other girls so i think she might be a teenager i don't know I just the thing that I'm getting from the the actual the article here that one paragraph initially thought to be Bubbles imaginary friend Bliss was later revealed to be an earlier version of Professor Utonium's perfect little girl experiment though she proved considerably less stable than he intended following a tantrum induced explosion he thought she was lost to him forever until now so basically she had a tantrum and and disappeared which means maybe she ran off had a tantrum and ran off. She was the first perfect little girl, and she turned out to be less perfect than 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 he expected. Mm -hmm. It's it, it is it is the the, the Lilith myth. I, I don't know if you you're familiar oh, with yeah. the Lilith myth, the the before Eve, but <laughs> that's what they've that's what they've basically done here. And of course, the the, the Lilith myth also includes Lilith be becoming a demon in uh, to to some uh some some aspects of the story um which kind of makes it weird if she's the only black character on the show 
Um, and I don't, I don't think the writers thought of that when they were, when they were creating this, but, uh, I, it, it'd be interesting if, um, oh yeah. And, uh, the Anano three, you mean he accidentally added chemical X twice? <laughs> um, well, actually that's, it that's was kind of a flaw no, too. Yeah, no, what actually, cause I watched the clip, uh, it was chemical W. Oh, that, dear that God. went in it, W as in woke, but actually because W uh, comes before X, and apparently uh, uh, he he did it like several other times before that. Uh, chemicals A through U, or V A through V. The, that that's what they did that when they when they were doing the episode about her origin. So yeah, chemical W. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, if the the if SJWs get a hold of the the idea. <laughs> That she's the the Lilith myth in Powerpuff Girl writing, and then they carry it forward to the the demon end of it, and then they go, "He made the black girl a demon." We are going to see rage. Uh, yeah, we are. Well, I don't know. I mean, they they actually. I don't want to get into it too much, but unless but they the, decide they like demons. I, when I was doing my research by watching clips on YouTube, as I wanted to know more about the the this backstory and stuff uh you know this is how i learned that uh this powerpuff girl is not there is nothing that explicitly says that she's black there's nothing the voice actress i don't even think is black like i'm, I'm not really sure but i don't think she is so there's no evidence to suggest that at all like other than her skin is darker colored but that doesn't say anything you know again it doesn't say anything i mean it's a woman made in a lab anyway does she even have a race so it, or it's a girl made in a lab uh but also uh, there is a point where um, him, uh, he he actually tricks her and uh, merges, I think he like steals her body or something and uh, uses it to make himself more powerful or whatever. So there is actually, Jeez. <laughs> they actually use him uh, in the story as the main antagonist that um, uses uh, and actually has been like manipulating her from the beginning. So, you know, so, spoiler alert, um, that's, that's hilarious. to put himself in a position to essentially steal the Powerpuff Girls' power from the most powerful one. And also, that's... Bliss has uh, just crazy power. She doesn't actually make any sense. She's very, other than the fact that she has these temper tantrums, she's pretty Mary sue -ish. She just does whatever she needs to do. Um, as opposed to the other girls that just, they're strong and they fly and they have, I think they have eye lasers from their gigantic eyes. So, but yeah, Bliss is all over the place. Yeah, it, that that's funny possessed. though because yeah, it's, she was possessed by him. That's what happened. It's like it's like they 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 somebody read the uh, some some summary of one of the Lilith myths and uh, and decided you know how can I how can I incorporate this into the Powerpuff Girls as as innocently as possible. <laughs> Right. Uh, for, for those guys who are writing about, I see people in the comment section. Him, I think him has to be spelled in all caps. H I M. That's the, that's how you have to say it. I don't think you can do any lowercase letters in that. It's just him. All no, caps. it's it's no, it's just the first letter is capitalized. I remember that from before. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, just the first letter. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, I don't know if uh, Max or Mike have any comments on it, but. Um, I thought I would just, this was something I wanted to just clarify about and um, just sort of like, you know, because I know people were talking about this new Powerpuff Girl for a little bit, so I figured we should chime in briefly. No? Nobody? I Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to make sure because my, my, my mute button is still messing up. I just want to point out one quick thing that I, I never realized until just now. Uh, <laughs> Powerpuff Girls. It's a good example of a TV show that's about 20 years old where there is a significant number of young dudes that watched it. So, oh, yeah. And I can guarantee you, like, I watched the Powerpuff Girls when I was young. I probably haven't watched a single episode in about over a decade. But I remember enjoying the show quite a lot, and it had a bunch of strong uh, females that kicked ass. So if you want to ask guys like me or Brian, you know, people that are sort of into that nerd culture. On top of that... Yep. On top of that, they were not feminists because there was actually exactly. an, there was actually an episode of the Powerpuff Girls that has a feminist villain in it, and you should totally watch it if you don't know about it. And you ever see that? What? You ever see that clip uh, where it's like a Mojo Jojo is like, 
being oppressed. Yeah, that was and all they, the... yep, and all the animal activists come out and uh, yeah. yeah, to protect him. Yeah, there were definitely Gennady Tchaikovsky, who was uh, the director of that original show from the like what was it late nineties. Um, he was not a big fan of social justice warriors. <laughs> mm. Well, at least he reflected it in his show, at least the extremists. So he wasn't, um, you know, because the feminist episode is really good. And uh, the, um, yeah, the, the feminist uses her feminism to get away with crime, basically. She's just like, but I'm a woman, you know, and they had to, like, let her go. And, and, and they did for a while, and they realized they were getting tricked. And then uh, the, the I'm a being oppressed episode that uh, Mojo Jojo was in. So that, I think mm. that was good stuff. Because the girls didn't need those things. They were strong without it. So I dug that. Now, in this reboot, I understand that there was there was like a MRA villain. I remember them talking about that in this in this episode. He was like a lumberjack guy with a beard and it was this weird like uh stereotype of a man, a manly man. Uh it was in an episode of this new reboot, but I didn't watch it. So I don't I don't know if the same people are involved. Uh, I never looked into it. I know that I don't like the animation as much. Um, and I don't know. It just doesn't seem as funny. It's kind of like, it's just kind of lame. So, but but you know what? As much as I liked the Powerpuff Girls, I actually liked uh, Dexter's Lab more. That that had some crazier shit in it. And Samurai Jack, of course. And the Clone Wars. But anyway. So, let's... <laughs> <laughs> if there's no other comments, we should move on to the next. Uh, we should move oh, on to the last one. Qu one quick question: sure. Does the reboot have the original theme song? I don't know. Oh. I, I just watched. Uh, I, I just watched some clips. Maybe there, there was. A, oh, and then this this episode ended with all the Powerpuff Girls merging to become like a giant Powerpuff Mecha Girls girl. <laughs> Zord thing that like like a Specter Man giant to fight him, and, and, and they did all these anime tropes. And it was actually really kind of cringy. I, I oh. was I was not impressed, but it's just me. Mm. That's too bad. Anyway, um, I did just the only yeah. thing I can say about the Powerpuff Girls is the show made it so that anytime I hear the term reboot associated with a show that I I used to love when it was when it was on and any episodes were new, I break out in a cold sweat mm -hmm. and have nightmares. That's it. Oh, and, and, and also regarding Dexter's Laboratory. Omelette du fromage! Omelette <laughs> <laughs> du fromage. By the way, uh, if I ever get the chance, Hannah, I'm just going to whisper, Star Trek 2009 in your ear. No! <laughs> <laughs> so, let's go on to the final story. Uh, so here we go. Trash Override Network re Review. ZDNet has published a review of Zoe Quinn's book, Crash Override, which is about Gamergate and online hate. The first part of Quinn's book is about her background and how her abusive boyfriend conjured the angry mob known as Gamergate, because he has necromancy powers or something, that rapidly assembled and arrayed itself against her and sent countless death and rape threats and how this led to her hiding out and on friends sofas afraid to continue work on the games that she was developing <sighs> she also talked about being further victimized by a court system in which a judge told her to go offline and find another career maybe he's trying to look out for you zoe the author of the review notes that while quinn wrote about her interactions with police and courts she doesn't appear to have sought advice for dealing with cases of domestic violence. According to the article, the rest of the book is about her activist efforts. Quinn found that the instruction to never feed the trolls was wrong, and that this advice only worked when all trolls wanted was to shock people. Now, however, she claims you must effectively disappear from your own life. Quinn created Crash Override Network, a group of volunteers that cultivated contacts with platforms to enable speedy escalation of complaints and collected evidence of threats to counter the trolls of Gamergate. As cited by ZDNet, Quinn claims none of this was enough because platforms were not keen on collaborating and that the tech world's companies are soiled. The following are the opinions of Stapler. This is the person who wrote this piece for us. 
I don't usually inject much of my own opinion into write-ups, but this one about Quinn's personal anecdotes of being victimized by Gamergate grind up like nails against a chalkboard of my own experience. I wonder if I would have even formed a friendship with my now husband if it wasn't for working on a game about the Honey Badgers being kicked out of the Calgary Comic Con. We never actually finished it. Gamergate planted a seed of doubt when it came not only to gaming journalism, but to the media in general, and stressed to me how important it is to try and get to the truth of so-called hate movements. Whenever a group is written off and dehumanized, especially with simple moral characterizing buzzwords like misogynist or now um, more and more Nazi, it is a good time to reassess who is bullying who. To help with the reassignment of Gamergate, there is James Desborough's book that you can read for free if you have a subscription to Kindle. Link is in the show notes. Inside Gamergate, a social history of a game revolt. There is also a so there's a link to the book Inside Gamergate, a social history of gamer revolt in the show notes. If you go to the show notes page, you can see it there. I did an interview with James Desborough, who you guys also might know as Grimachu, and you can get the book for free if you have a subscription to Kindle. Otherwise, it's very inexpensive. Um, so that's basically the write-up for this article. So they reviewed it. Obviously, they said it would quit on everything. They questioned nothing. And they're pushing the book very hard. Does anybody have any thoughts? There, I don't understand. I, Brian, I, I just I don't get it. There's so much evidence just that this woman... It, 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 if, yeah, she's a woman. That <laughs> that she is exactly the perpetrator of the type of behavior that she seems to rail against. Whether you're talking about the stuff that happened back in Gamergate days, where she docks people like the fine young capitalists and Mike Cernovich, or whether the, you know you're talking about the revelations that came out that she herself is a self admitted rapist. Well, I mean, like not publicly, but you know, in, in the chat logs that were produced. And even going up to when she created Crash Override, I don't even know if that actually accomplished anything when she made that. But all you, you can look at the chat logs that came out from Skype uh, that Ian Miles Chong verified where there were actual group members that were trying to sick the Internet on people that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how this bitch can get so much attention when proof is literally in the fucking pudding. It's so obvious. Because she suits a narrative that is being promoted. So everybody that is trying to promote promote that narrative is going to exploit her willingness to do anything to stay in the spotlight. And I I mean, that's really what she's all about, because Gamergate didn't give a shit about Zoe Quinn. None of the none of the Gamergate yes. supporters that I knew cared one rat's ass about this woman's opinions about what she was doing about what she had to say nothing we didn't care about her game we didn't care about any of it the only reason anybody ever paid attention to her was because her behavior opened up the the door to shady backroom you know bullshit and uh you know that and that happened because she was an abusive girlfriend and and of course then there was the shit she stirred uh on god i can't think of the wizard wizard uh chan oh yeah but wizard any, chan yeah, that's right yeah wizard chan and that i mean that was flat out cruel that that was that was beyond heartless and you know, it was it was to the degree of of feeding on people's pain, heartless, and uh, and that's it. You know, I, I saw she she's like the least relevant of the literally who's, and that's saying a lot because none of them are really of of any significance. No, you know, uh, and, and none of the, the like they all act like the controversy happened because this group formed to pick on specifically them. When what they really did was because this group existed and because this group was talking about a political issue and there was a consumer revolt, they put themselves on the other side of it so they could play victim in order to direct a spotlight at themselves. That's it. Mm -hmm. And it just like, it kind of galls me 
that we have to continue to pay any attention to any of them at all at this point. It yeah, just... well, we, well, basically what we're doing is we're just pushing back on their narratives because they keep, they're getting right. like these humongous platforms and we'd rather not. And that's one and of the reasons why we call it a literally who thing. The, the, the whole thing with Crash Override, which, by the way, is, is what named after a character in an edgy movie about hackers that isn't even realistic. Are you talking about the movie yeah. hackers? Is that what they're referencing? Yes. Oh, my God. I only saw that once. What a dumb movie that was. I'm sorry. I did it, not it like was, that movie. It was... It was it was embarrassing, oh, and it, you didn't look, even have to really know anything for it to be an embarrassment. It, yeah, if you want to immediately make me like question whether or not I want to watch any movie at all, cast Matthew Lillard in it in any role, and I will immediately be like, I don't think I want to see that. That's, that's yeah. going to be my jumping off point right there. That's where that came from. But the organization itself was created specifically for the purpose of ganging up on people and then using false accusations of harassment as a tool of harassment and silence and silencing them with it. Uh, you know, so like here, here we are now it's three years after, after the event and they're still, that's, they're still obsessed with it because that's all they've got. You know, and it's at this point, it, it disgusts me to realize it, but I got to feel sorry for all of them because of that. Can, can you imagine if that was your career? Oh, yeah, that's, no that's pretty sad. Um, Observing Libertarian gave us five bucks and he writes, rule three of SJWs always lie written by Vox Day is SJWs always project. And Jazz E gave us $10 Australian. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you, Observing Libertarian. Little unrelated, but Clementine Ford was going after a Florida man for calling her a whore on Facebook the other day. Her followers were even contacting his employers from Australia. So, um, th well, this is the kind of stuff that Zoe has done with the Crash Override Network. I mean, Ian Miles Chong, yeah. who, uh, who was part of it, has written extensively about it. I'm actually waiting to see if he's going to do a review of her book. I don't know if he will or not, but he'd probably be the best guy to ask because oh, he's man. been on both sides, right? So I'm wondering if he will. I should send him a message if he hasn't already. Um, but then, you know, the problem is if you want to review a book, you have to buy it. And, you know, I bought that Hillary Clinton book and I don't know. <laughs> I wish I didn't. So. Um, well, it, but, it was entertaining. No, I mean, it was, and I'm probably gonna. Yeah, I'm probably gonna read. I'll read from it in the future too, because. Um, oh, by the way, speaking of which, a couple things I wanted to say. So, if you go to Amazon um, and you go to uh, Zoe Quinn's book, you'll find that it has 53% five star ratings, 36% one star, 5% two star, 1% three star, and 5% four star. So there's like a, a bit of a swing of negative reviews, but they're not quite as many as positive ones. I guess that shows some kind of promise, perhaps, that there are people that are starting to question this shit. But one Didn't of the, your mom give it a bad review? Her mother? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> That'd be Fuck. great. I, that was going around on Twitter, and I don't know if it was ever confirmed. But yeah, that, that, that has been said at the very least. Mm. Davy, so um, like honey, food Gamergate did nothing wrong. Sorry, sorry Brian. Sorry said, no, it's okay. M most undesired uh, made a comment saying, "I will buy you that book if it'll get you to read it, Brian." Um, okay, if you want to. Uh, Nightwish fan, nineteen ninety one, gives us five dollars and says this book belongs in science fiction genre fantasy. So if <laughs> if you that's go, only because science fiction doesn't have a genre for nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and I got one other thing to say. Okay. Uh, uh, calling Clementine Ford a whore is an insult to whores everywhere. Whores provide a damn good service for the money they make. Clementine Ford does not deserve that level of respect. No. Mercedes Carrera, she's a fucking saint. Don't you even dare. Oh, she's absolutely a saint. Itself. Yeah, Clementine Ford, is a, is, she's a bestial woman. Um, okay, so uh, one of the things that I thought was really funny is I looked at uh, Zoe Quinn's reviews and I thought I'd see what the one-star reviews gave. Now, there is a meme or it, like a, a, a funny Amazon thing that I saw. You can find it on Imgur or you can probably go to Amazon and see it. Have you guys ever heard of the uh, sugar-free gummy bears? 
So, what? do you know? Okay. Oh, 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 oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, the sugar-free gummy bears, okay, uh, the, you could buy them on Amazon, and then the, the sugar substitute, whatever it is, I don't know what it's called, that goes into the sugar-free gummy bears acts like, apparently, according to the reviews that were written about it, some kind of insanely powerful um, laxative. So when you when you eat the gummy bears, it flushes you out. It's like the gummy bear cleanse. Okay, somebody and and so so when uh, they're being reviewed, if you look up the sugar free gummy bears on Amazon, look up the reviews, and you will see that there are people writing like hilarious reviews about their experience with these gummy bears, and like where they were when they ate them, and what their poop was like, and everything else. They're very very fucking funny. So one that is in particular is like extra long. That's really great <laughs> that somebody wrote. It's like the legendary review. It's like the funniest one or at least the, the biggest one. And uh, somebody took that w review word for word and replaced Gummy Bears with Crash Override the book. So basically the experience of reading the Crash Override Network book that Zoe Quinn wrote is identical to eating sugar-free gummy bears. And they just replaced the entire review with the, with the language um, from the gummy bear review and just changed the subject uh, from being about the gummy bears to being about the books. And it, it's actually pretty funny. So some people were having some fun with that. And also, um, there was something else. This is not unrelated, but I got to say it because it's about the, the Hillary Clinton book. Apparently... The Hillary Clinton book, which did have a lot of negative reviews too, when I was looking it up, okay, now there are only positive reviews. No. The, yes, the negative reviews have disappeared. Oh, are Hillary you surprised? Clinton's. I'm not. Not at all. No. <laughs> uh, Observing Libertarian gives us $10 and writes, Whores are capitalists plying an honest trade by providing a valuable service to willing customers voluntarily paying for said services. Whores are respectable. Clementine is not. So, Clementine Ford is a bleeding inflammatory wound upon the ass of humanity. <laughs> That's right. And I hope she gets butt pimples. Uh, can but you yes. link, just sorry to be so immature, but can you please link me to like that uh, um, no sugar gummy bear page? Yeah. I just want to write a review that's like, hey, you ever been to Wendy's and had one of those uh, Frosties? <laughs> um, sure, sugar free gummy bears <laughs> should come right the fuck up. It's the Haribo Gold Bears. I'm pretty sure it's these. Um, I gotta see though. Okay. No, five pound. Uh, maybe it's this one, the one pound. Uh, it's it's just don't unless it's a gift for someone you hate is the the mm. name of the review. Um, that my ex. I, I I have it right here. I believe this is probably this this has to be the one. Um, Give me the link. It, it's all right. Let me let me get it for give you. It, put it, just put it in here so that Max has it. You don't have to give it to me. <laughs> oh, just I'm in the wrong chat. Damn it. Put it in the live show. The yeah. gummy bear. By the way, the, I love how you termed it. The gummy bear sounds like the only type of uh, Actually, diet I would ever go on. That is um, the title of another review. The gummy bear cleanse. I, I don't know if, if, if it's right. yeah the gummy bear cleanse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain. Uh, well, actually, no. It's in the it's it's in the first or the second sentence of the review. It, it starts out, "Oh man, words cannot express what happened to me after eating these." The <laughs> yeah. gummy bear cleanse. If That's you it. are are someone who that can tolerate the sugar substitute, enjoy. If you are like the dozens of people that tried my order, run. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. That's exactly the yeah, one. And they yeah. just all they did was just replace uh, gummy bear with crash override. And it's the crash override cleanse. It's exactly <laughs> what they wrote. Oh man, words cannot express what happened to me yeah. after reading this. The crash override cleanse. If you are someone that can tolerate the fact substitute, enjoy. If you are like the dozens of people that tried my order, run. First of all, for fiction, I would rate this a five. So good, soft, true to fantasy, fruit flavor, like the genre variety. I was a happy camper. But, or should I say, but, with two T's, not long after reading about 20 pages of this, all hell broke loose. I had a gastrointestinal experience like nothing I've ever imagined. Cramps, sweating, bloating beyond my worst nightmare. I've had food poisoning from some bad shellfish. And that was almost like a skip in the park compared what, to what was going on inside me. <laughs> so, and it continues. It's basically a better piece of literature than Zoe's book. So you may as well go to the um, review page on Crash Over Override, uh, How Gamergate Destroyed My Life. 
the book and just go to the, the negative reviews and read those. You will definitely get um, your, your, uh, F, your clicks worth. <laughs> Do it because laughter boosts your immune system and it's fall, so full, cold and flu season is coming up and you need it. <laughs> yeah. Do it because it's the best medicine. N- Nightwish fan 1991 gives us five dollars in rights, but according to Hillary, the media is controlled by conservatives, and they were too hard on her. Yes, I remember her saying that. I almost died laughing. Scott Mal or Malave gave us gave us five dollars and says they removed the Haribo. The Amazon one has the reviews. I guess you'll have to uh, get that from. Um, you you may have to just go look into Imager or something, but you can find it. Ryan Field gives us oh, the, five ninety nine and says, "I shall pay to hear you continue." Well, thank you. You talking about the Amazon review that they can't find the Amazon review? Uh, well, they said it's on Amazon, but I guess it's not the Haribo. I don't know what what brand is it. It just says customer review. Oh yeah, it just has. I, the see, review. what I did was I, I I looked up some of the the terms I remembered from it, and yeah, that yeah. Oh, well, I looked, well, I yeah, looked up it's right here. Amazon Bears, uh, got Gummy Bear Bears review, funny, and then some of the things I remembered from it, and uh, and that brought this right up. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So just check it out. It's pretty funny. We got the link right here. Uh, so the Great Indoor 1979 says, "Are HBR going to talk about the Emmys?" No, I mean, I don't know. It's just, it was just nobody watched it. I think that's basically the only thing you can say about it. <laughs> Nobody watched it. Well, I could point <laughs> out the fact that the Emmys have been irrelevant for most of our lives. But it's it's also had the worst ratings in a while. I think last year's Oscars also had really bad ratings. As They're well like as the, the literally who's shows. of television and like nobody, movie. People are not – they're they're tired of the virtue signaling yeah. though. It's like it, it really is exhausting. And I didn't even know it came on. I don't I – don't, I think the reason why the, the ratings are so bad for these things – is because so few people watch TV now. I, I don't think that a lot of people watch television, specifically on the channels that usually advertise for the Oscars and the Emmys and the Music Awards and all that shit. So yeah. they, well, there's they... like there's an award show for everything now. I would I would not be surprised if somewhere out there there's an award show for for the biggest pimple on your ass. Um, I mean, it's it's gotten that to the point where they're giving out awards for everything. Yeah. I mean, like people would watch the Oscars. When it was it was a way to be greatly entertained while getting to see, you know, the stars that had had the great and really touching performances of the last year um, get get rewarded for it Mm -hmm. when you felt that they really deserved their reward and they would, you know, go up there and they would be enthusiastic about it. And uh, and and, you know, they were always. Uh, thanking the people that helped them and, and everything, and that was it. And you didn't, you didn't. There was no politics in it. It was just, it was a very feel good thing. And then they started getting political, and they started like giving out awards for more and more trivial reasons, in more and more shows. And it's gotten to the point like, it's it's ruined it really. Yep. Yep. So. Uh, just, uh, so yeah, I mean, I didn't really have anything to say about the Emmys. They're just lame. And a lot of people have already talked about it. But, um, going back to this Gamergate thing, so we're going to be wrapping up at 6.39. We can do the after show. And then I want to eat my rib dinner. Uh, if you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read the Inside Gamergate, a social history of the Gamer Revolt, which is James Desborough's view, for free. Um, otherwise you can get it on paperback for $8.00. And 72 cents. It is probably much more concise and honest. Uh, James Desborough, we've had on the show many times. If you want to get both sides, feel free to get both books. But I have a feeling that uh, James Desborough's accounts will probably be better. And maybe uh, Ian Miles Chong could also read his book and give us his views on that. Because, hey, again, he did. He was on both sides of this whole thing. So Now, we're going to be getting ready to wrap up the show. Before we do, I want to show you what we're going to be talking about in the after show. We're going to be talking about comics. I've been talking a lot with a couple of the comic book YouTubers, and we've been seeing things unfold. One, this is super interesting. Um, there is a Comic Con in Portland, Oregon called the Rose City Comic Con. They are banning Hydra and Red Skull cosplays 
because it's too much like Nazis and fascists, and they're very anti-fascist these days, which means they can't even allow fictional characters made by Jews <laughs> for as bad guys, by as, the way, as villains for their stories because it's just too triggering for people. So can't remind of, people that can't Nazis have were the bad that. guys. Yeah, they can't can't do can't do that can't do that because a person who dresses up as the Red Skull is probably sympathizing with the Red Skull's beliefs and wants to acquire the Cosmic Cube, I guess. And yeah, then, Hugo Weaving. That's that's just like you know when I when I cosplay as Samara from The Ring, I run around yeah. giving people seven days to live. That's what you want to do, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> And the other thing is, another story we're going to look at is PSA, one of the biggest proponents of firing Aubrey Citizen is a well-known anti-diversity troll campaign. Audrey, Aubrey Citizen is basically a writer for a new G.I. Joe comic. Um, I remember in the 80s, the G.I. Joe comics were pretty hardcore and uh, pretty badass, actually. And uh, this Aubrey Citizen person is an anti... He basically just hates the whole idea of G.I. Joe because it's masculine, because it's warlike, because whatever... Um, and he's been shitting on it while he's been writing it. This has actually been a trend that we've been noticing where people who hate the source material in comics are writing stories for it. And then what they do is they use it as a platform to talk about their personal beliefs and politics, which, of course, no one wants to hear. And as a result, various comic book YouTubers who have more subscriptions than they have comic book sales. I'm not kidding. This is true. Have been criticizing them online. And so Bleeding Cool, which is the latest in anti- customer um i guess comic book journalism or nerd culture journalism has written an article about this saying the reason why aubrey citizen uh is possibly getting fired or has been fired is because of the trolls online so we're going to be looking at that specifically they name the comic book youtubers that i was talking about such as diversity in comics if you don't know who diversity in comics is you should go subscribe if you care about comic books he's really good he's got experience in the industry he knows how it works um, and he does a lot of content. So, anyway, that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. I want to thank Hannah, Mike, and Max for coming on with me. And I want to thank you guys for watching. As you can see, the chat now will display uh, your comments from every chat you're in. So, no matter where you watch us from, you should be able to comment. And you might notice that um it's a little bit stabler today i don't know if there were any problems with the stream but it seemed like there were no issues but if if there ever are try twitch you could still comment we'll see your comments i'll comment on them uh if i if i find this interesting so feel free to do that and uh yeah so i want to thank you guys for coming on and we're doing everything we can to try to make the experience a little bit better every time as you can see so feel free to rate comment subscribe share discuss things in the comments section i know that you know some of the stuff that uh we talked about was opinion based and um i i'm i'm more than welcome to listen to what you guys have to say i don't pretend to have all the info or the facts on any of the stories so if you want to bring some perspective or additional information i am totally open to seeing it i look forward to seeing your comments and we're going to head into the after show now so i want to thank you guys again for coming on and have a lovely lovely